Welcome to the Myth and Magic Authors Podcast, folklore and fantasy topics aimed at creative storytellers. To write stories and challenge your brain with exciting ideas, delve into these presentations and reflections. See how fantasy realms are based on actual world history, legend, and lore. Study fairy tales, nature fables, and supernaturalism to engage in a jumble of concepts that will trigger your fancy and get you writing imaginatively. Now, here's your host, Neil Mack. The Real Valentine I remember the day, as a teenager, that the Roman Catholic Church basically demoted, decommissioned a valentine from the Holy Book of Saints. I was a teenager, and it was 1969, and I remember feeling really bad. Why? Well, because he was one of the two saints who meant something to me, and to other common people. The other saint, by the way, was St Christopher, the patron saint of travellers and lost children, who was also demoted and downgraded and decommissioned around the same time. Actually, the church removed Valentine from the general Roman calendar. But that's not what it felt like at the time. It felt like a demotion, and the tabloids of the uh, period, they said that he'd been stripped of his saintly rank. Regardless of my general feelings of exasperation at a church which seemed to be out of touch with its people, it's unlikely that Valentinus ever existed. Or if he ever did, any good works that he had done would have been elaborated and embellished upon over many centuries of retelling. The most reliable source of Valentine's existence is the venerable Legenda Aurea, which means golden legends. And this was compiled in around 1260. So in theory, it's about a thousand years after Valentine's life. And this is a reference that provides dates and information on the saints associated with each day of the liturgical year. The Legenda Aurea states that Valentine was executed for refusing to deny Christ by the order of Emperor Claudius in the year 269. It also states that before his head was cut off, Valentine restored the sight and hearing to his jailer's daughter. It's just a guess, but it's commonly believed that the Emperor's order for the execution was carried out at the Flaminian Gate, which is a large square in ancient Rome, on February the 14th. An even later source is the Nuremberg Chronicle, 1493, that suggests that he was arrested, that Valentine was arrested and imprisoned after being caught marrying Christian couples, and after he was found helping Christians who were at the time being persecuted by Emperor Claudius. A variety of years have been given for his martyrdom, including year 269, year 270, and year 273. And I ask you this, if we don't accurately know the year of his death, how can we so be so sure of the day of his death? Well, it's because the African author Pope, Pope Galasius I, who was also a very busy encyclopedic writer, and there were more than 50 different Christians called Valentine, and they were all persecuted, and in all probability, many of them, possibly all of them, were executed. So it seems that the Feast of St. Valentine, the one that Pope Galasius added, is a commemoration and a dedication to all of them. And furthermore, it seems highly likely that Galasius was trying to erase the ancient pagan festival of Lupercalia, or Lupercalia, which the uh, Romans celebrated between the 14th and the 17th of February inclusive. Even though Christianity was the religion of Rome, some pagan ideas, such as Lupercalia, had persisted. Lupercalia was a very ancient festival, probably pre-Roman, most likely Arn Age. And yes, you're right if you think or you guessed it has something to do with wolves, if you guessed by the name Lupercalia. The idea of the festival of wolves was to avoid evil spirits and to purify the city, 
um, to release health and fertility before the spring. Special priests would have used instruments of purification for an act that they called Februa, F-E-B-R-U-A, thus giving the month of February its name and the word we still use for the second month of the year. As you will no doubt recall, the founders of Rome, Romulus and Remus, were children who were found and saved by a wolf, a she-wolf named Lupa. And incidentally, I explored the founding of Rome in Myth and Magic episode 20, which was aired on January the 23rd, 2020, so it's worth listening to that. Romulus and Remus hid in a wolf cave known as the Lupercal Cave. This cave is located at the foot of the Palatine Hill, upon which Romulus is said to have founded Rome. So the rites of purification began in this cave, and then it's believed the priests would go around the city, cleansing the most important and the most sacred places. The Lupercalia had their own priesthood, known as the Lupercai, or Lupaci, the Brothers of the Wolf. And after an offering was made of salty cakes and a freshly sacrificed male goat and a freshly sacrificed dog at the cave, the Lupercai would then cut away the skins from the sacrificed animals to make swishy belts with them. And these swishy belts are the februa, remember that I mentioned earlier. And these belts were used to cut and slash away the evil that was thought to exist in the city. An eyewitness um, account of what actually happened from that time um, is this. Many of the noble youths and magistrates ran up and down through the city, naked, for sport and for laughter, striking those they met with shaggy thongs, and many women of rank also purposely got in their way, and, like children at school, they presented their hands to be struck, believing that the pregnant will thus be helped in delivery, and the barren to pregnancy. Despite the prohibition in 391 of all non-Christian cults and festivals, Lupercalia seemed to be celebrated right up until 496, when Galatius apparently came up with the idea of replacing it with the Feast of St. Valentine. But if you really want to blame somebody for the Valentine myth, then you should come much closer and you should come to England and blame Geoffrey Chaucer. Geoffrey Chaucer, as you know, is the father of English literature, and in the 1370s he began writing lines of poetry that were the very first to introduce the ideas of romantic love to the general public. Basically, he's the inventor of the what we now call sappy and schmaltzy line of poetry. These were known generally as Valentines because his first and his best love poem of the type was titled Parliament of Fowls, in other words, lovebirds, and has the following line. For this was on St. Valentine's Day, when every bird comes to choose their mate. Chaucer's verses in the style of a greeting card were very popular at the time, and since. And the idea of frivolous romantic love took off. Unfortunately for Chaucer, St. Valentine's Day that he's talking about in uh, Parliament of Fowls is actually May the 3rd. This was due to an ecclesiastical misunderstanding of the period. And later still, Shakespeare's love-struck Ophelia spoke of herself as Hamlet's Valentine, most likely because Shakespeare was influenced by Chaucer himself. So did the church have to relegate poor old St. Valentine? Well, probably not. But did they want to have an implausible and an unverifiable saint on their books? I suppose they didn't. And I think that's why they removed him from the general Roman calendar. So all we're left with is the truth about what we might describe as Valentine love. And Valentine love, I think, is this. It's immaterial, it's indivisible, and best of all, it's implicit. Like the guy himself. What is the essential ingredient of fantasy? The Poppins paradox explained. Apropos something else entirely, my wife yesterday suddenly exclaimed, 
I didn't think Mary Poppins was a fantasy adventure. I looked at her and I grinned. Then I made a sarcastic observation, probably along the lines of, no, I reckon it was a documentary. But I later added, what do you think the story of Mary Poppins is, if not fantasy? As you can imagine, there was no answer to that question. There was a slap. However, the exchange got me thinking, what ingredients are required before you can say that something is a fantasy? For example, using the Mary Poppins as a source to extend the argument is one criteria of fantasy that it must reproduce an imaginary universe. Now, the reason I ask this is, do not all works of fiction, be they speculative fiction, magazines, art, movies, etc., that they all fabricate an imaginary world? Even the daytime theatre shows and the primetime soap operas and even the most daring kitchen sink dramas, regardless of the creator's impressive attempts to depict reality and literal gritty truth, are they not imaginary universes? So why don't we call all of them fantasy? The Poppins paradox is that the story is based on a real world setting, in this case London. At a point in real world history, and it's a Disney-fied Edwardian England, I suppose, in the uh, film, and it incorporates a, a cast of what seem to be, anyhow, on the face of it, ordinary real people. Actually, the British Australian writer P.R. Travers always knew that, and she always intended that her books would be classed as fantasy adventures. And that's because they featured a magical English nanny. So it is the addition of magical, you know, the magical element that makes her story a fantasy. Or is it? Because she obviously didn't try to attempt to create an imaginary universe. And I think as fantasy writers, we get a bit bogged down and easily convinced into thinking that we need to create imaginary universes for our fiction. So from L. Frank Baum's Oswald via Tolkien's Middle Earth and across DC Comics' Multiverse and into James Cameron's ecosystem, dropping by the continents of Westeros and Essos on the way through, we have enjoyed so much reading about and creating our own detailed imagery for invented worlds that we sometimes get lost within them. And by the way, these are known as paracosms, and I discussed them in quite a lot of detail in my non-fiction manual, So You Want to Write Fantasy. And I also explained in my book why you and I might be drawn into paracosmic worlds. Now, I'm not saying this is a bad thing. I'm just saying it's not essential for fantasy. A detailed imaginary world is not essential. It is not an essential ingredient. But that brings us back to my original thought. What is the essential ingredient of fantasy if it's not an imaginary universe? As I've said before in much more detail, the supernatural and the fantastic have always been an essential part of any fiction project, not just fantasy fiction. In fact, ancient civilizations couldn't separate their storytelling you know, their factual storytelling, from fantasy. And maybe neither can we. Imagine if I gave you a true life account of one hour of my life, you know, from yesterday. A bit like a witness might give an accurate testimony in court. I think if I did that, it would bore you to tears and you'd probably end up unplugging me or falling asleep before I'm done. Not only would my minute-by-minute and step-by-step -step story be tremendously tedious... It would also be long, endlessly long, you might think, because you would have to take more than an hour to narrate, because every component or every aspect of that hour would have to be fully explained. Even my thought processes would have to be explained. But most undesirable of all, there wouldn't be any point to it. There'd be no benefit. So you'd end up asking, what was the point of all that? Why did I waste a good portion of my life listening to you going on about what happened for an hour. What did I get out of it? In short, a real life account of an hour of my life would be an absurd and unproductive waste of your time, let alone mine. Knowing this to be true, ancient storytellers sensationalised, romanticised and glamorised their stories. They made them fantastic. 
even if those same stories were based on true events or real-world histories. In other words, they hyperbolized out of their accounts, and the public loved it. The public lapped it up. So the storytellers knew they were onto a good thing. And that's how real life and the fantastic got mixed up together in fiction. But then came along a Bulgarian-French historian named Todorov, who lived 1939 to 2017. And Todorov famously claimed that the fantastic is a liminal space within the architecture of life. And that's why I bang on about liminality so much. So I've previously covered liminality in much greater detail in my Myth and Magic podcasts, starting with episode 13, then I expanded on the subject in episode 40, and I continued with my expansion in episode 51. Episode 13, episode 40, and episode 51. But basically, and very basically, liminality is the idea that there are moments in our lives when continuities and situations dissolve or they become uncertain, or outcomes that are previously certain are thrown into doubt. And these are what he called liminal periods, or thresholds in our life. And we all, all of us, experience them. We will find, all of us, that during liminal moments, and these are most often experienced in the rites of passage, by the way, our understanding of time becomes fluid and malleable. And when time is amorphous like this, everything we think is true can be doubted. And I propose that conjuring liminality, the positioning of ourselves and our readers on an impermanent, almost evanescent threshold, is the only essential criterion of fantasy. And that is why portals are so important in fantasy stories. You leave from a real place and you enter the magical world of Narnia through a wardrobe. You board the Hogwarts Express and enter an imaginary world from King's Cross Station in London via platform nine and three quarters. And Bilbo Baggins and after him Frodo leave the Shire to enter into their magical adventures at a liminal moment in their lives. It's their joint birthdays. Even the act of picking up a book and immersing oneself inside the world it describes, or luxuriating in a fantasy adventure on the screen, is a temporary journey into metaphysical dimensions. Yes, reading and viewing is a transitional moment, a temporary interruption, if you like, in how we experience the mechanical passage of time. How often do we suddenly blurt, Good grief, is that the time? after reading In Bed for Too Long? And how often do we leave a cinema and enter the pale sunlight of the afternoon blinking and thinking to ourselves, gosh, the world seems really weird out here. And back to Mary Poppins. She's caught up in the lives of the Banksy's children, Jane and Michael and twins John and Barbara. She's caught up in their world by the east wind which blows her in. Why then? Because it was a time of liminality. A fluid, malleable and impermanent time when new rules could be established for the young family and a new normality could begin. Poppins always promised that she'd pop out of their existence once the wind changed. And she did. Poppins' period in their life was transitional and she, the bearer of change, was merely a temporary, evanescent visitor. So to sum all this up, Fantasy has many desirable ingredients, magic, supernaturalness, fantabulous plot elements, highly imaginative themes, highly imaginative settings, magical creatures and detailed imaginary universes. But it only has one essential criterion, and that's a sense of disorientation at a transitional moment. The one essential ingredient is liminality. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Do you have any comments or do you have any ideas? Please tweet me at Neil Mac, N-E-I-L-M-A-C-H and good luck with exploring liminality and the ingredients of fantasy. Fantasy